Desmond is like a child himself. He loses his wife, he loses his father, which was his backbone, and then he has to become a man. I like that she was ahead of her time and incredibly willful and strong and tells him that as much as she likes him, he's not gonna get anywhere with her unless he stops drinking. It's a different kind of role. And uh, even when I'm directing him and listening to him talk and watching him, it seems to be a different person than the Pierce that you talk to when you're not filming. What was interesting about this case was the fact that he weakened the link between church and state. And that was the beginning of a new era, I think, in Irish public life. It is a seminal case, you know, it's one that tested the Irish Constitution and actually changed the Irish Constitution. When I read it, that, uh, you know, it was, it was a really good feel story, and it's a heartwarming story, and then I found out it was true. It's just a lesson to the very pragmatic people. It doesn't really think that there's much hope. And of course there wasn't much hope, it's kind of a miracle that it happened. He's the first man that to fight for his children in the course. Well, the church and the state really kept a very tight grip on the community. Uh, they were the dark 50s in many respects. And, you know, I grew up, you know, 53, I got a taste of what it was like uh, as a young boy. But the church ruled and dominated uh, the people enormously. And uh, so for someone like Desmond Doyle, who was an ordinary man, to go against them, that was colossal. It is the little man's movie, but you know, I mean, that's the beauty of Pierce having done it, because without him, obviously, we wouldn't have um, gotten the funding and the attention, and um, this man's story probably wouldn't have been told. And you know, it's one of those stories where the writer, Paul Pender, he had written it, and he had always imagined, and if you look at the old pictures, Desmond Doyle looks just like Pierce. I mean, they're very, very similar. And uh, Paul Pender was in LA, and he just brought the script up to Pierce's office. How many scripts were left for act, you know, actors of that stature? And he said, please, I wrote this for Pierce Brosnan. And he's thinking they're all going, yeah, 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 right. And then three months later, he got a phone call. Or I forget the exact amount of time, but, and they said, I want to do it. I was sitting at the commissary one day and I saw Pierce Brosnan walking across MGM Plaza. And I thought, What's he doing here? And I was so naive, I hadn't realised, as someone then told me, his offices were upstairs from mine. And he had a company called Irish Dreamtime based at the MGM lot. And I thought, well, how easy is this? We're in the same building. All I have to do is give him the script. But of course, it has to go via an agent officially. But my agent, who represented other clients and was a rival agency of the one Pierce was with, refused to give me, the, give, refused to give me permission to give the script to Pierce. So I ended up sacking the agent and putting the script on Pierce's desk with a scribbled note saying I'm a Scottish guy in town for a couple of weeks and I'd love if you read this script because I know you want to do Irish movies. Two weeks later, Bo St. Clair called me and said, why don't you and Pierce meet for lunch in the commissary? And the rest is history. You know, when you have a story which you just, you love picking it up. Some scripts are heavy to pick up and some are light to pick up. And you just pick it up and you go, you open it anyway and you think, ah, oh, yes. And then you think, oh, what happens before that? And what happens after that? And before you know it, you know, an hour or two have gone by and you've kind of done your homework. And the nice thing about it is that Paul Pender has a, has a, has a light touch to it. So it, uh, it's not heavy. It's not like some Irish pieces that kind of get bogged down in the depression and the troubles. <laughs> that uh, byline in the thing, a true story, but I didn't know. Um, but uh, when I read the script, I loved uh, what the story's about 
and uh, it's got a great, you know, sense of uh, place in the 50s in Dublin, uh, you know, and uh, my, certainly my parents lived here at that time, and um, so I have a lot of memories almost through their photographs. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, to be back in Dublin, and uh, it's a lovely group of people, and, you know, uh, Steve and I have done, I don't know, this is our fourth film together, Steve and Ray, and uh, Pierce and his whole, his whole crew are, are really lovely. I'm sorry I miss our appointment, but there's really nothing more I can do for you anymore. Oh, really? Well, your being sorry isn't going to get my kids back now, is it? I'm sure the Yank here is having great fun, seeing what a lot of bloody spineless jellyfish we got over here. But ask yourself this, Mr. Big Shot. What if it was your family? Wouldn't you fight tooth and nail to get them back? Or are you just another heartless, gutless bastard? And uh, Bruce Beresford, who's an incredible director, who's done some of my favorite films. So they are recording. Yeah, well, they're, good, they're, man, they're loving good man, good man, good man. They're loving it. At the end. What might be quite good is at the end, if you could all mime applause. Just to, re to remind them, just do that, you see, so that just to get to the help of the response. Paul Pender, who wrote it, met the real Evelyn in Glasgow, and then um, she lives there. And then he wrote the story and sent it to Pierce on spec. And then Pierce called me and said, I've got this script you might be interested in. And he posted it over to me, and I thought I liked it. I mean, it was those days, it was an early draft, it was much too long, but it was a very good script. We got a good cast, eh? Well, we just sort of made up a list of who we wanted in and asked them all. And maybe they weren't doing anything else, I don't know. But we did get this very, very good cast. I was in Los Angeles casting it, and I said, well, what about Juliana Margulies? I mean, we were trying to get an actress, you know, they were trying to get a sort of name actress. And I said, oh, well, that's always tricky if they're playing Irish. And then I thought, well, I'd worked with Juliana before, you see, and I said, I do know a girl who actually looks quite Irish. She's got this sort of dark Irish looks and curly hair. And I said, she looks Irish, so she's very, very talented. And I said, she'll be able to pull it off. Let's see if she wants to do it. So we called her and uh, she said yes virtually straight away. It all starts with the director. And when you have a director who people love to work for, the set is going to be a harmonious place to be. And there's no power struggles or, I mean, and, and Bruce, um, has worked with Rich, our first AD, before, so there's already a little family there. And, and Pierce has worked with Bruce before. He did uh, Mr. Johnson in South Africa 12 years ago, whatever. So it just felt like everything just suddenly pieced together where it, it was a story that was meant to be told. So it's really sweet, and I think it has a good heart. And it's nice to work on something that has, is just about, you know, a true story and... and and having faith. And this little girl, Evelyn, the little girl Sophie who plays her, she's never acted before and she's fantastic. I don't think it's fair that I should be treated special just because my daddy's going to be famous. But you didn't your daddy tell us not to cut your hair? Yes. And didn't he tell you to let me go home? You didn't take a blind minute notice. <sighs> Look, if I were to cut your hair, Sister Teresa would not be amused. I'll explain it to my daddy if he gets cross. And who will explain it to Sister Teresa if she gets cross? You, Sister. The nuns are horrible. Well, there's one, there's Sister Teresa and Sister Felicity. They're really, really nice. Except then Sister Bridget is awful. Bridget Bridget, that they call her. So. Sophie, uh, Sophie's wonderful. She's very strong, got great concentration, and wonderful presence to her. You know, there's about 12 girls. And she was the one that just popped. So it was easy in some respects, but uh, Ross and John Hubbard, the casting director, and casting, you know, like you know, and like we've heard everybody say, or men like John Houston, if you cast it well, then you really don't have to do too much. Do you want to hear the prayer I said last night? No, we do not. Not so, Mr. Wolf. It is material to the court's evaluation of the child's character. Evelyn, let us hear your prayer, please. Lord God, you guide the universe with wisdom and love. Hear the prayer we make to you for our country, the beautiful country of Ireland. Through the honesty of our citizens and the wisdom of those who govern us, 
May last and peace be delivered and truth and justice flourish. Amen. I think it's just if, they, if the part touches you, it might work with me, if, if you can find some connection in it that you feel you can relate to, then it's worth doing, you know. I've known Paul for a long time, though I never worked with him, but, uh, and I hadn't seen him for a long time, but suddenly he was in Dublin and he had this script, and this, he said, um, I think you should probably be in this movie, and I said, well, you know. And then he told me Bruce Beresford was doing it, and I mean, Bruce is one of the directors anybody would have on their list to work with, and I know Pierce very well from a long time ago, and I know Aidan very well. Turns out Alan Bates is in it, and he's maybe one of the great British actors the last 30 years, and, and Juliana comes along, so it's a pretty attractive project, really. What I find is that you, 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 know, you read the text and you say, this is a great story, I love this. And then, of course, months or years go by and you're busy working on it, and then, of course, the day comes when you have to play the part. And you go, oh, my God, I... I don't know, how do I, how do I play the part? I don't know how to play the part. They've got the wrong guy, you know? I'd look around the set and I'd see other guys that would be far better at playing Desmond than me. That, that being said, I'm having a good time playing it. Of course, I'm singing a few songs. That's right. That'll be a first. <laughs> her rosy cheeks and ruby lips I own she has my heart in throat so fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Desmond is like a child himself. He's lost his wife. For one reason or another, you never really know why they fell out of love. He's drinking too much. Can't seem to hold a job down. He loves the children. He's, one of, he's a very loving parent, but he's not a very responsible one in many respects. Um, but he does the best he can, and throughout, you gradually, throughout the film, watch him pull his life together. And that comes from the loss of the children and the realization that he loses his wife he loses his father, which was his backbone, and then he has to become a man. I haven't done family law in nearly 20 years. I've only a working knowledge. You mean you don't know what you're talking about, then? I mean, can't you read some books? <laughs> There's a the solicitor that's first on the case is played by Stephen Ray, and uh, he's sort of flop fobbing off the case, saying this guy has no hope in hell, and then I get involved as his friend and the barrister and drag Stephen back into the case. And then we both remember an old professor of ours uh, who was a real character played by Alan Bates, and he plays Tom Connolly, who's a bit of a drunk, but a kind of a brilliant mind at, at what he does. And we, we rope him back in, out of retirement into c coming onto the team. Uh, yeah, case is interesting. Hopeless, but interesting. You really think it's hopeless? This case is what I used to call a real St. Jude. Why St. Jude? Because St. Jude is the patron saint of hopeless cases. The chances were, you know, obviously slim that they were going to be able to, but I think these men read the proofs of this case and read the facts and went, this is, you know, a horrible injustice is being done here and were maybe sick of the little petty crime things that they were working on or whatever and said, let's just, you know, what the hell? I mean, let's go for it and, and see if we can't help this man and, you know, use all of our faculties, that all the things that we learned in law school, you know, challenge ourselves. He doesn't trust any of them, really. He's out of his depth, you know, with Beatty, who he, he finds to be quite comical and a bit of a joke, Beatty. He's a bit nervous of Nick because Nick is very American and very flash. But Beatty is just some kind of wallflower that's over there, you know, and he can... He's the brother of, of Bernadette, of course, so he has to, and he likes Bernadette, so he has to play the game somehow. But ultimately, he needs these men uh, to get his children back. So there is a respect there. 
Have I messed it up for us all, then? Well, you may have. We're just gonna have to show that this was an isolated incident, not part of a pattern of behavior. I hope that was the only such incident. Of course it was. Apart from the time when you tried to punch Father O'Malley at Fergal's. Oh, that. Oh. And when you tried to kidnap your kids. Yes, but I was drunk on both occasions. Oh, for God's sake, man, don't try to use drunkenness as a defense. It doesn't impress them. Haven't you heard the phrase? As sober as a judge. Hmm. The little scene we just did in the back of the car was funny, because we were squashed up, you know, Juliana, Aiden, and myself. So I kind of put my hand around her, like, the, around the seat. And then Aiden thought, hang on a sec, maybe I should put my arm around. I said, no, I got there first, sorry. <laughs> you know, <sighs> I beat Quinn to the punch. <laughs> so it went well, then. It went like a dream. <sighs> Desmond remembered all his lines and spoke them beautifully. <sighs> Lawrence Olivier had better watch out. <laughs> so you didn't attack a nun, then? No, I did not. Yeah. Well, I'm learning the rules of the game. But it's a little bit of a love triangle between the three um, until she makes her choice. Who's your man in the sharp suit over there? Who should I know? <laughs> he looks like a yank. Maybe he's a friend of hers. Maybe he's a chemist. Huh. One is uh, working class and has three motherless children and doesn't make any money. And the other one is a lawyer from America and uh, has all the money in the world. And she chooses the working class one. It's just <laughs> my kind of woman. I think Desmond, you know, realizes what a powerful influence this woman is gonna have over his life. You know, Desmond is the good Irish male and she's a fine woman and he likes his drink and he doesn't wanna go off the drink, but he knows that he has to go off the drink because he has to get his kids back, because he really is reaching rock bottom. And also, he sees in Bernadette a woman of great strength and, and beauty, and sees his salvation there as well. Oh, I just think, you know, you and I... Oh, do you really think I'd kiss you just now? It'd be like kissing a soggy beer mat. But you just said... No, Desmond, I said you have to give up the drink. Oh, for God's sake, that's the hardest thing I could ever do. The second hardest. Getting your family back's the hardest. It's very light and warm, the script. The script is, even though it's about something very serious, it's, it's, it's very warm in its touch, and I think people will like all the characters. You were just recording something that uh, happened and was... A change of events, a change of a change of uh, way of life for people. You know, where one parent can bring up a, a family, and the husband can bring up a family. It doesn't have to be the wife, you know. So, uh, it was one of those big step forward cases. It's a story of, of you know personal achievement against really rather tremendous odds, and it's a love story, incidentally, mm. and it's a story about you know the father's love for his children. The world is in such a sad place, and I think it's just a nice story that people are ready for a little bit of a break to disappear into a movie theater for two hours, or knowing Bruce an hour and a half, and just have an uplifting tale, you know, that isn't about, there's no sex, there's no violence, there's no crime. It's a story of the heart, and I think that in lieu of everything that's gone on, we're ready for that. And then you think, well, I'm in the business of making films. What kind of films do you want to do? You know, and I'm sick of seeing violent films, be it that there's violence in a Bond film, but somehow the blood is not real in a Bond film. It's, but just, you know, there's got to be a, a different side to filmmaking now. I think we have to find stories which are from the heart, tell of our human existence, call it old fashioned, but, uh, Ones of love, and ones of courtship, and ones of friendship, and ones of family. So for me, it was a joy to hop on a plane and come over here and do this film. And I think everybody possibly felt the same way. We haven't spoken of that after the events of September the 11th, but uh, could be timely.